Without further ado, let's introduce our first cast member, Zui Nguyen, who plays Man. Fred Nguyen Han, who plays Bon. Sandra O oh as Sophia Mori. Watch one day, the captain. Leave Fitchman, executive producer. Susan Downey, executive producer. Robert Downey Jr., applause, Professor Hammond, the first congressman, the most poor and executive producer. Don McKellar, co-showrunner, executive producer, and writer. And finally, director Park Chan Wook, co-showrunner, executive producer, director, and I uh, have to confess, I, I'm, I'm continuing to have an out-of-body experience that began last night, watching what you just saw on the big screen. Uh, and I'm a writer, so I've spent my entire life in my head, in my room, writing these words, and all of a sudden, we have this incredible team producing this show. And I've been living in L.A. for uh, 27 years as a writer. And whenever I tell people in L.A. that I'm a writer, no one cares. <laughs> So, first question is for a writer, Don. Yes, yes thank you, Via. Uh, I've been told, Don, that this is an unadaptable novel. <laughs> who, to who told you that? I don't know, many, many people. Uh, um, so, Don, uh, what was the process like for you to adapt this novel? This is such a weird format to have the author of the book interrogating all the people that... Uh, well, I better be on my toes here. Uh, I will say, honestly, the same thing I would say if you weren't here. I loved the book when I read it, and I, I thought it was incredibly fresh and bracing and very unusual. Uh, it, it was a book of ideas. It was very smart, but also very entertaining. So... On that level, I wasn't scared. Immediately when I read it, I thought, you know, it's very pop culture savvy. It's not sort of Proustian, meandering interior monologue. There's lots of incidents, the big set pieces that immediately I saw that I wanted to see on the screen. So, um, of course, it had won the Pulitzer Prize, which is never a plus when you're adapting a book because, you know, Want the only way is down. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, you know, there's the old Hitchcock adage that it's better to take uh, Pulp Fiction and turn it into a masterpiece than the reverse. Uh, so it was scary. Um, but uh, it helped when Neve Fishman, our producer, said that Park Chan Wook would be the director. Yeah. Because. Uh, and it's not just because I've worked with him and I like Tim and uh, I love his movies, but I also thought the hardest thing to adapt was the voice of the book, really. It's very distinctive. It's uh, extremely entertaining, a sort of raconteur told in first person. It's sort of unreliable, but very informed. Uh, it's, it's very freewheeling and kind of perverse at times. And I thought, okay, Park Chan Wook is all of that. You know, he has that subversion, he has the intelligence, he has the sort of wit, as I say. So as soon as I heard he was involved, I thought, okay, I can, I can see it. Yeah. Well, you know, you, uh, me, and, and Neve from very early on had conversations about what languages this TV show would take place in, and I was very clear that I wanted a lot of it to be in Vietnamese, because these are Vietnamese people. What are they? What language are they supposed to be speaking? English with a Vietnamese accent? No, I mean, it had to be... Vietnamese when they were Vietnamese. So, 
what do you think it's and a lot of the dialogue is actually in Vietnamese. So what do you think it says about TV audiences that hopefully they're now ready to watch a show from HBO that's going to be global with a lot of it in Vietnamese dialogue? It's funny you said that right from the top. They, the Vietnamese have to speak Vietnamese. And we totally agreed. We were, yes, absolutely. And uh, we were prepared to go in and fight for that. But we, I have to say we never really did do that fight. We went into A24 and said, it's a deal breaker. They have to speak Vietnamese. And they went, yeah, of course, great. And, you know, we, Team Downey got on board. You know, they're going to speak Vietnamese. And they went, yeah, well, well yeah, they're going to speak Vietnamese. And we went to HBO and they said, yes, that's exactly what we want to hear. So I kept waiting for the day that someone at HBO would say, Don, all those italicized lines, those are going to be Vietnamese. You know, someone's going to speak those in Vietnamese. And it never really came. I must say I was really surprised. So... What that says about the industry and a culture, I'm not sure. It says, I think, that the industry recognizes uh, in a capitalist way that uh, there's a market there for those, you know, those big successes. For Speaking of markets, I, I'm pretty oh, oh, oh. sure that Don and I got our shoes at the same Nike Odd Lots yeah. shop. <laughs> this was completely... Little sub -intent. Product placement. Thank you. He doesn't want me to get too communist on you or to pretend that I'm not a capitalist. I'm in. Um, it's true. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, so, uh, where was I again? No, so, I mean, so there's the market level, but also there's culturally level. I think uh, people recognize that uh, it's a bit silly. We always talked about it like the Nazi thing. Uh, that we didn't want to do. Well, you know, in movies about Nazis, the Nazis always speak English, but with a British accent. <laughs> and then the Allies speak American English. And it's like, it's ridiculous. It's sort of these ridiculous conventions that we grew up with that we just can't do anymore. In fact, in Sympath The Sympathizer, the novel, uh, I mock that. So it would have been totally awful yes, for me that personally really if there were people speaking English with Asian accents. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, it was really, for me, as, as someone who grew up in a Vietnamese language household, it was so moving to hear the Vietnamese dialogue uh, and of many different accents and many different generations in this TV show. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, um, obviously, that involved finding actors who could speak Vietnamese. And I know that there was this global search for talent. It took place over many countries. Sometimes actors had to audition for, for years for their roles. <laughs> we'll get to that. Yeah, but, yeah. we tortured that boy. Oh, yeah. But Susan, I'm wondering if you can tell us more about this casting process that brought this incredible talent to the show. Well, as you said, it was incredibly thorough. Like, it, it took place well over a year of time, and that put a lot of these actors through their paces for that entire time. But the thing is, okay, so you start this project and you have Robert Downey Jr., and you have Sandra O oh on board, and then you're saying, oh, we gotta put a lot of other people higher than them on the call sheet. And it's like, that's a crazy task. Um, and the captain, obviously, if he didn't work, even with these incredible actors already in place, the show doesn't work. You, you need to find that character. So obviously, that was a key hire that then, kind of like um, if anyone plays Sudoku, you know, you, you have sort of your set numbers. So we had our set numbers. But she loves a bit I of Sudoku. I love a bit of Sudoku. <laughs> but that's honestly what the casting process was like because we cast this incredibly wide net. As you said, it was a global search. And we ended up both in front of and behind the camera with a an international casting crew. I mean, from Australia to America, Canada, obviously, England, Vietnam, uh, Korea. Like, it was just incredible. Um, so we cast this incredibly wide net, and Hua came in actually quite early. Um, and what was interesting is we, we kept having him read again and again, and because if someone comes in early, that's really good, and you're like, nervous to go there like you feel like you have to drill down more and meet more people and all that but what that process has enabled us to do was really discover that there is so much depth of talent in the vietnamese community they just haven't gotten a chance to be showcased and they certainly haven't gotten a chance to be the leads in telling a story from their perspective and 
I mean, it sounds like you had a feeling early on, but then you just felt like torturing. We needed to torture you to <laughs> just to, see to, how to prepare you. Put a screen role. test you until you broke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, just to get you early prep for the role. Um, but it is true. I mean, dude, yeah. you you were in pretty much every yeah. day of the shoot, yeah. and even in the flashbacks, your voice is there. Even in the one or two scenes where your character acknowledges that you didn't witness it, you're still talking about it. And so that endurance test showed that you were going to be able to take this on your shoulders, which you needed to do. But the point I was gonna make, and I'll wrap it up because I know Robert will make a joke or something that I'm going on too long, um, is that once we found our captain. We'll have our last question after this. <laughs> <laughs> um, once we found our captain, then we could figure out who his two best friends needed to be. And that's how, that's what I meant by Sudoku. It's like you get the captain, suddenly you can cast Bon and Mon, all right? And then, even then you know, well, the general has to play in so many scenes with him, so that's a certain dynamic. Once you get him, then you can fit, figure out Madame, then you can figure out Lana. But it all started with the captain. So, you know, again, it was just diligence and time, and that's both on our side, but also on all of the cast side who read so many times for us. And I can say, Hua, every time he read, it became deeper and more complex. And sometimes people kind of um, level out, and you're getting the same performance each time, and that was not what was happening. So we knew I had a right guy, and then we were able to fit in everyone else, and last thing I'll say that is, see, there you go. I mean, I didn't, I didn't think Juan would wind up getting better reviews than I did, but <laughs> I've made my peace with it. You know, every moment of it. Oh, thanks. Okay. Secret, Shows we did no, our no, job, no. right? Secretly, secretly, he hoped that Juan would get better reviews. Of course, he hoped all these guys would. Um, but no, it was, it was a great process, and it enabled us also to not only work with people who were well trained, but also there's a couple people in our cast that are key that, that wasn't even their day job. They were a graphic artist, they were a well-known director in Vietnam, that kind of thing. So it just opened our eyes to all the possibilities. So Hua, all yes. begins with you. No pressure. Um, and you're in almost every scene, I think, and obviously the story is told from your point of view. Uh, Tell me what it was like when you got the call that said you had been cast opposite Robert Downey Jr. and Sandra yeah. Oh and working with Director Park. I mean, uh, just on the point of reviews, I must have just used my entire paycheck to pay the right people. So I'm happy about that. Uh, <laughs> Payoffs don't work in Hollywood anymore. Oh, damn. People are too bitter. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, first of all, I just want to say like thank you so much, uh, everybody here, for coming out to just watch um, what we created, because I know that um, HBO and A24 and Team Downey, Rhombus Media, through the guidance of Park, director Park Chan-wook and you know, the masterful adaptation of uh, Don McKellar, we really tried to accurately portray um, the Vietnamese experiences and their perspectives in this story, from you know the set design to the dialogue to just the stories that of refugees coming to America and try to give it three dimensions as opposed to just, um, you know, desperate people needing to be saved, which is all too often the narrative that we see a lot of the time. Um, and I guess in auditioning for this role, uh, you know, I was put through my paces, um, you know, I let go of this project so many times, I came back to it and they were like, oh, we love you, but also for months I didn't hear anything, so I was like, what am I doing wrong? Am I an idiot for believing that I thought I could do this? We love you periodically. Oh, thanks, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, you know, I flew to Korea to meet director Park and you know, I first auditioned for this in January 2022 and then I literally, through the next nine months, I uh, met these guys on Zoom, and then um, I met the casting on Zoom, and then I flew to, uh, to Korea to, meet, to have dinner with Director Park, and then I flew to LA for the final time to meet all these guys and have to do my piece um, in front of them. And then I flew back home, and by September, I was just a wreck, a mess of a human being. And um, I remember it was the 21st of September, 2022, when 
uh, Don's head popped on, popped up on the Zoom call, and he was like, this and that, and but, but blah, 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 and he was like, but you've got the role. And, uh, yeah. And then, did, didn't you immediately go surfing after that? I you did. your nose? I did. I actually, um, so here I, I, with a broken I'm, a, I'm an avid surfer, I do it all the time, and throughout my history of surfing, I've broken my nose probably about three, four times, and it just so happens that on this occasion, I wanted to celebrate really hard, and I went hard. Um, and that was funny, because I turned up to set and was like, hey, I've got another choice for this character. <laughs> really um, funny. Yeah. <laughs> very, very funny. But, um, yeah, like, the first day of filming, I just, uh, you know, I did so much work in this audition process and tried to dive deeply into the character and... You know, to tr go of it, are you? <laughs> no, no, you got the part. Yeah, no, I, I really wanted to feel trauma firsthand. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, I, I'll wrap it up. Uh, the idea is that um, I, 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 I dove really deep into trying to find these uh, stories and perspectives that really fueled um, what I believe to be the emotional and psycho psychological um, a core of what this character was, and I and I tried to hold all of these uh, experiences that have never been told before at the core of what uh, this character was, and I hope that I've been able to portray, in, even in what you've seen today, that journey. Well, you actually mentioned getting to the set on the first day, and then you didn't tell us what happened. So what was it like? You should, was, your, was your nose broken in many places? And... Oh, I mean, I'm sure they could tell you, but like, you know, I'm, it was, uh, it was, eh. no, I, mean, I will say it was also yeah. a trial by fire because the first day, his yeah. first scene was with Sandra, yeah. the second scene was with Robert, <laughs> yeah. and we were like, okay, <laughs> show your stuff, boy, and he, and yeah. it was pretty impressive. I mean, he really stood up to them immediately. We were like, okay, he's going to be all right. Yeah, um, I guess uh, I'll take your, your words for it. <laughs> Well, you're all going to be very familiar with Floss one day after seven episodes of watching him shine on the screen and getting better reviews than Robert, uh, according to Robert's own testimony. Um, but That's all by there's, design. <laughs> there's a lot of work that takes place behind the scenes, and um, this series wouldn't have happened without executive producer Neve Fitchman, uh, who was the first person who came to me wanting to turn this novel, an adaptable novel, into a TV series, so he saw something in it, and he had the confidence to think he could adapt it. Um, but it was really Nib's not, not me personally. Of course. Well, yes, but you're. But I'm saying Nib's vision, his persistence, his doggedness has seen us through the last several years, and it was Nib's talent as a producer that lined up all these different parts of our collaborative process that really made it possible. And I'm wondering if you can give us insight into. Uh, another aspect of this production, which is what it was like to to shoot overseas and and, uh, and work in Thailand and and assemble all the cast and the sets. Uh, well, first, you know, you thank you so much for entrusting all of us and entrusting me at first, and then one by one, all the all the different people that uh, that came on board with this. Uh, you know, right from the first time that we met, you know, we discussed Park Chan Wook as the person that uh, you thought would be. Uh, the ideal person, and uh, you know, he came on board, which is amazing. And then Don, and then the rest of us joined Team Downey and uh, A24, and then eventually HBO, and then eventually, after years of trying, you know, our dear friend right here and all the others, um, you know, it was a big responsibility, really. Uh, you know, I felt a massive responsibility. You know, to I gave you my word that we honor the book, we'd honor Vietnam, we'd honor the Vietnamese language, we'd honor, you know, Vietnamese everything, you know, and culture. Uh, and, you know, we, we did try to shoot in Vietnam. Uh, it was during COVID when we, when we you know, we, we knew that it took a long time to get permissions to do things, and the book is controversial. Uh, so we did go there, but then because we couldn't actually go ourselves, uh, and present ourselves and have the passion. Uh, Don and I have the experience, we made a film 25 years ago called The Red Violin, which was partly shot in China, 
and set uh, during the Cultural Revolution. And we knew that that would be difficult. And when we first went to China in person, they told us there was no re uh, Cultural Revolution. And it's a figment of Western imagination. And we had to go back again and again, like eight times we went to China. And I thought arrogantly that we could do the same in Vietnam, but then COVID happened. So we couldn't go. And then the bureaucracy just stretched. And you know, contrary to what is said, like they never actually told us no, they just didn't tell us yes, which I think is a very Vietnamese thing. Uh, so the clock ran out and, uh, you know, Thailand beckoned, and you know, even Thailand is so, so different culturally, it's so close, but Thailand's never been occupied by a European power and, and uh, colonial power, and so the architecture is different, everything is different. Uh, but we had, um, you know, one of the world's great production designers, Donald Burt, uh, one of the greatest uh, costume designers, uh, Danny Glickman, uh, Glick, Glicker, uh, and, uh, you know, they, they had teams of Vietnamese people around them, uh, as we had teams of Vietnamese people on language and post and every part of the production. Uh, and we found cities in Thailand that are not touristic cities, but ones that, uh, you know, haven't been rebuilt. So they resembled Saigon of, you know, the mid seventies. And, uh, we, in the same way that we searched for Hua, we searched for locations, we searched for you know, for costumes, and, and uh, we took the same kind of passion uh, and responsibility that we did, you know, that all these people did in their own fields. Tell us a little bit more about the 1970s, because a TV series is set from 1975 to 1978. Uh, Donald Byrd, Danny Glicker, you mentioned these names. What, what, was, what was it like for them and for you to try to recreate 1970s L.A. in the TV show? Well, there are a lot of uh, parts, you know, we're not from L.A., Deirdre Park and Don and I, um, you know, our friends here are. But uh, as it turns out, there are a lot of parts of L.A. that, you know, are still in that period in terms of uh, architecture. Uh, and again, we had an incredible location team that just scoured the city in the same way that we scoured the world for cast, you know, and we just had to... We were never satisfied. Director Park is never satisfied. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Doc That's sometimes is more satisfied, but Director Park <laughs> never. Susan Downey is never satisfied, <laughs> which is why I love her so much, uh, and, you know, as a, as a partner. And so, yeah, we just, uh, we, we ended up finding the, the right places. I think the, the show looks amazing. Um, the show does look amazing. And, I, and again, Further testimony to the collaborative enterprise of this thing, of this of this TV series, and now it also is really important that Director Park is a part of the TV series. And as Neve said, he was my first choice for uh, taking charge of this TV show. So I feel like I hit the lottery and totally won here. Um, you know, he's made legendary films like Old Boy and the whole Vengeance trilogy. <laughs> Little drummer girl for TV, uh, and Old Boy was a huge stylistic influence on The Sympathizer. So we've come full circle. I couldn't even have planned it this way, except in a Hollywood movie. Um, <laughs> Director Park, what was it that, about The Sympathizer that appealed to you as a possibility for a TV show? As a Korean, there's a special emotion that I have uh, towards Vietnam. In terms of our more modern history, we share a lot of similarities. Yes, we have uh, suffered a long decades of uh, imperialism. And the thing is, both of our countries have been divided into two. And up north, the communism had uh, taken over, whereas both of the countries the, in the south, capitalism took over. And behind both, uh, in, on the e either side, it was Soviet, and on the other side, it was America. And we went through the war. It was cruel and violent. 
It was both civil war and at the same time it was international warfare. 그리고 남쪽 안에서도 극심한 좌우 대립이 벌어졌습니다. And even within the south, we went it was extremely polarized and we went through a very severe factions. Uh, it was divided greatly. 차이가 있다면 한국은 아직까지 분단 상태에 있다는 거죠. So if I have to mention the difference in Korea is still divided. 그리고 여러분들은 잘 모르시겠지만 베트남전에 한국도 참전을 했습니다. And I don't think a lot of you are aware, but Korea actually participated in the Vietnam War too. Because actually, America requested or asked us to. So we actually fought together with the Vietnamese people. And I think that's actually another story that we need to explore later on. <laughs> 그 그렇기 때문에 이 작품은 저에게 남의 나라 이야기로 들리지 않아 느끼지 않았습니다. And that's why the story it didn't feel like some next door neighbor's business to me. 그 완전히 내 이야기처럼 느껴졌고 I felt like this was a personal story that was speaking true to me. 그리고 소설의 문체의 그 화려함 그리고 그, 그 깊이 있는 사상 섬세한 뉘앙스 이런 것들이 바로바로 바로 시각적으로 읽으면서 바로바로 바로 떠오르는 And also not to mention when I was reading the novel uh, the colorful prose and the deep uh, depth in terms of the idea that it has and the nuance and the detail that all inspired me uh, visually uh, visual things to explore 그리고 하나 더 하자면 어, 아주 and not to mention, there's one thing I want to add. There's an element of it. maybe I should phrase it as a cynical side, but there was a dark humor in it too. 이것이 이 유머가 어, 시각화되고 또 살아있는 배우들에 의해서 연기됐을 때 훨씬 더 어, 살아날 거라는 생각이 들었습니다. And what I thought was if these uh, humor that is embedded within the novel can be uh, translated into a visual format and come alive in uh, with the actors that we have, I felt like it would be amazing to see it on the screen. So, uh, when the review came out, and I was directly to me, people were very surprised by the humor that was embedded in the novel. So yeah, there are a lot of reviews now coming up and people will come up to me after the screening. And the one thing that pleases me the most is when they mention that it was very funny. <laughs> I agree. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty funny novel in case you haven't read it. If you haven't read it, shame on you. Um, I knew that we had picked the right or I can't say that we had picked the right uh, director or tour for this. I, I, rather, I think Park Chang Wook picked us. But I knew I knew it was the right relationship when he came to my house and uh, he had clearly read the novel very, very closely and had great suggestions for how I could have written it differently. <laughs> but uh, I distinctly remember the moment in, in this meeting when Director Park said, I think we should have one white guy play all the white guys in the novel. Um, <laughs> so, Director Park, what do all these white guys represent to you, and what did you want to elicit from Robert in these performances? Yeah, I read the Steakhouse scene. I thought it was a 여기 이렇게 사람들이 앉아 있는데 이 백인 남자들이 그런데 왜 여기 이렇게 모아놨을까 이 작가는 생각하다 보니까 아한 사람이구나 사실은 미국이라는 하나의 존재의 서로 다른 얼굴들에 불과하구나 라는 생각이 들었습니다. So it was actually the steakhouse scene in your novel when I was reading that and I that moment, there's a 
a whole bunch of Caucasian guys sitting around. And I was thinking, why Viet uh, put together these people in one setting? And I came to realize these guys are actually one and the same because they're doing all different kind of things, but essentially they're representing America as a whole. So, yeah, this is a little bit of a 이게 무슨 저 비평가들이 막열번 보고 분석해서 알아채는 게 아니라 정말 직관적으로 관객이 알면 좋겠는데 이게 어떻게 하면 좋을까 고민이 됐다. And then that to uh, another idea that was what I was hoping to do is this idea to come around to the viewers uh, directly so it will be obvious instead of our critics watching it 10 or more times and dissecting and coming to a realization. I was hoping that it would be blunt. <laughs> but each of, I mean, all of these characters are very important in our storytelling. So I was uh, planning to cast all of the great actors for each of the roles. <laughs> Mark Ruffalo for this role, and then George, uh, Josh Brolin for this role. <laughs> They're going to be so pissed when they come to the house. They're going to be so pissed when they come to the house. They're going to be so pissed when they come to the house. They're going to be so pissed when they come to the house. They're going to be so pissed when they come to the house. But the thing is, if we have all these great actors and they perform superbly, then they, they would each of the characters will come alive and that would actually subvert my original intention that these characters are supposed to be one and the same. So I thought I would flip the script. That one actor will be playing all these roles. And that came to conclusion. So who should it be? <laughs> one and only Robert. So, Robert, we found that you've taken jobs from three other actors tonight. <laughs> we also realized that I am a blunt instrument. <laughs> can, can you tell us what it was, I mean, the challenge of taking on four different characters? What was that like for you? Um, well, I think, first off, it's been really great, and I think for for any, I think I'd speak for all of us to actually hear Director Park explain his reasoning and his passion for why by the time we were all together, we never really got that. So I'm just grateful that you asked that because I feel like it's completing our education here. Um, I feel like the exploitation and appropriation and marginalization of uh, peoples is something that I've witnessed in my many decades in uh, this this medium of uh, film and TV and it was really interesting to have the mirror held up and say how would you like to represent all the different ways in which you've witnessed these sorts of um, these degrading acts take place in society, in media, in um, the way a culture assumes the other is meant to be made small and just part of its story. And it was a great, um, it was a great opportunity and a challenge. So there was that on the inside. On the outside, we just had an amazing time creating with these kind of clay molded heads, kind of almost, we're, I'm with Director Park, and by the way, the crazy thing is, one of the easiest to communicate with individuals ever. I need a translator. <laughs> <laughs> this is easy. 
Um, and we just kind of were looking at these heads objectively. They're all versions of me or versions of white guys. We're like, maybe this one's got a little cauliflower ear. Maybe this one, you know. And so it was this very kind of transcendent experience. And then shooting it was just, for me, it was a joy and very free. Um, and now that I'm seeing it, I feel like it's finishing this kind of lesson set that started with what your novel was meant to be and was picked up with these folks coming to you and then with the way that Director Park rendered it. But again, I mean, it, it comes down to, I am truly blown away by the sophistication and versatility of this cast. And it was the one last thing that I really had to learn was until you experience the richness of what um, every different culture and identity has to offer, you are ignorant because you don't see how much there is to learn from what's right around you. As you said, there's four different characters, four different heads that you were working with. What was the physical transformation like for you to do these four different, very different I was a breeze. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Susan can speak to this a bit. I try not to think about that. I try not to, I'm not the furthest thing from a method actor you'll ever find. I just know that there's voices in my head and characters I've seen and versions of guys. So whether it was, you know, kind of a little bit of Jimmy Spader for you know, uh, uh, Claude or whatever. It just kind of came to me. And then sometimes Director Park would remind me that we have to keep them all very separate and succinct and we would make adjustments. And it was, uh, it was just a blast. Um, Sandra. 